Trinity Channel Christian Apologetics Marathon. Join us online, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube Live, December 14th, 16th, and 18th at 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For more information, visit www.trinitychannel.com or call 248 416 everybody welcome my name is Matt Slick I'm the founder and director and president of the Christian apologetics and research ministry and today we have some great guests on and we're gonna be discussing a topic is science compatible with Christian theism we have three great guests I'm gonna mess up this guy's name not on purpose but uh, dr. Fazal Rana and we call him fuzz hi and he's how you doing <laughs> and then we also have dr. Uh, oh, it's gonna be Richard Howe and he, he'll be on here in a second here. There we go, Richard Howe. Hi. How All are right. you? Nice smile. And with the infamous uh, Greg Kokel from Stand to Reason. Good to All see right. you boys. Nice seeing you guys. So what I was thinking we could do here is uh, you guys could introduce yourselves. Uh, most people know who I am on ABN. I've been here quite a few times. So uh, uh, Fuzz, why don't you, uh, you start? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I'm a biochemist by training, and I am currently the – Vice President of Research and Apologetics at an organization called Reasons to Believe. And the focus of our organization is to show uh, the scientific case for God's existence and the reliability of scripture. And uh, we're primarily an evangelistic organization where we're trying to really use science as a bridge to the gospel. And uh, I uh, came to faith in Christ uh, when I was a graduate student and it was the elegant design of the cell's chemistry that convinced me there must be a creator, and that uh, opened me up to hearing uh, and responding to the gospel. Oh, interesting. You and I can have some great conversations, mm -hmm. a lot of questions. And uh, we have Greg Kokel, at least on my screen, the bottom left. So, Greg? Yeah, good to see you. I'm, uh, I'm the I'm founder and president of Stand to Reason. We've been around for uh, 28 years now. And uh, actually, our goal is not evangelism as much as it is discipleship. And so uh, we train Christians to think more carefully about their convictions and to defend their convictions, classical Christianity and classical Christian values in the public square. So we're dealing with a variety of different issues, but uh, we want them to be equipped <laughs> to do the work of evangelism and fulfilling the Great Commission. And I find myself in a, a kind of a unique situation. Um, I, I get to uh, listen to the smart guys like Fuzz and, and Richard, you know, and then I, we do translation. We try to take the, the, the stuff the smart guys say and uh, the work that they do, and then we try to give it handles so that the rank and file can uh, can make use of it. And uh, one of the ways we do this is a tactical maneuvering in conversations. I've written a book about that called Tactics, a game plan for discussing your Christian mm -hmm. convictions. And uh, uh, anyway, I think that's the unique place that we play um, in this this whole enterprise. Wow, good stuff, good stuff. And of course, last but not least, Richard Howe, introduce yourself. I, I'm glad I, to know that I'm one of the smart people. You should see how Greg <laughs> talked about me when I'm not around. So <laughs> maybe we'll catch some of that on the, on the camera a little bit. <laughs> yes, I'm uh, I'm Richard Howe. Uh, I am a philosopher by training. Did a uh, MA at Ole Miss and a PhD at University of Arkansas. And I am now what they call Emeritus Professor of Philosophy and Apologetics at Southern Evangelical Seminary, which basically means that I had a few years ago retired from full-time teaching, but I am adjunct still at the seminary and I've been able to twist their arms enough on some occasions to be almost a full-time load again. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. 
the thing that's distinctive about SES, Southern Evangelical Seminary, is it's really top heavy in philosophy and apologetics. It was founded or co-founded by Norm Geisler, who was my mentor when I was a student of his at Dallas Seminary back in 19... 19- <laughs> <laughs> and uh, eventually became a, a, an associate and a colleague of his, which I'm very excited about. So um, maybe my perspective will have something to contribute, because I think a lot of the questions that are occasioned by the discussion about the intersection of science and Christianity are uh, uh, also imbibe philosophical assumptions and categories and such. So perhaps maybe a philosophical perspective is warranted. Whether it's my perspective that's warranted, I'll leave you to judge that. You know, let me jump in there a little bit, uh, Richard, because this is a really important point. Of, I don't have a PhD like you guys. I, I have, I'm have i a master twice, not a doctor once, and uh, took apologetics master under Craig Hazen, who's now at Talbot. And uh, I took my master's under J.P. Moreland in philosophy, also at Talbot. But uh, one of our guys, one of our trainers, our speakers at Stand to Reason, uh, took his uh, master's over there uh, at SES. And so uh, we have found that enable for uh, enable for uh for us to be able to translate well these things, we have to have a, a good con- understanding of concepts above the scientific discussion that inform the scientific dis- discussion. And, and so much of this discussion about the alleged conflict between Christianity and science really is not scientific at all. It's philosophical. And mm-hmm. I'm hoping this is going to come out in our discussion here uh, this afternoon. Well, you know, uh, just, just just to keep beating the, the horse here, uh, I, I would actually, as a scientist, would would fully agree with both Richard and, and Greg, is that many times the issues are not actually scientific issues. They're, they really are philosophical issues where they're masquerading behind a lot of scientific concepts and jargon, but they're ultimately philosophical issues. And in my experience, when you engage somebody who is a scientist or strongly influenced by the sciences, many times they actually are very poorly educated, but very well trained. Scientists are extremely well trained, but they don't really have a good grasp of the history of science or the philosophy of science. And as a result of that, settle into certain philosophical perspectives that then shape how they view Christianity and the relationship between science and Christianity. So it really is very much a, a philosophical conversation. And, you know, what, what I uh, also want to point out, and then we can, we can you know, move on, is, uh, is that actually many of the arguments that we would make scientifically for God's existence are really philosophical arguments, where the science is actually informing the argument. Mm-hmm. So. Wow. You know, I would love to sit with you guys <laughs> at a table, a cup of coffee, and we go for three hours, because... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, it'd be yeah. great. Can I add something to what Fuzz said? Sure, uh, please. It reminds me of that book that Stephen Hawking wrote a number of years ago, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. It's called The Grand Design. And basically, mm-hmm. Stephen Hawking, who's now gone, but quite an intellect and especially a uh, standout in science historically, uh, writes this book called The Grand Design, talking about the universe. And basically, his argument is there is no grand design. Uh, but um, he starts out by saying that philosophy and theology are just simply dead, and science and physics is what reigns and Mm -hmm. physics will explain everything. And then he spends the next three chapters doing really, really bad philosophy. (laughs) And, uh, and so that just goes to show, you know, as Einstein has said, scientists may be good in their field, but they're lousy philosophers. And that makes lots of problems when this kind of discussion comes up. Yeah. Yes, it does. You know, I spent a great deal of time on the web and uh, I'm two, three, four times a week. I'm in various chat rooms debating these topics. And uh, this is really, we could talk so much about some of the things that those issues that have been raised, the relationship between philosophy, science, actuality, transcendentals, presuppositions, all of it, all of it ties in. I really love it. Let's, let's just get to the topic of the question at, at hand. Uh, is science compatible with Christian theism? So I'm going to ask this of each one of you. So, uh, Why don't we just do that? Uh, Greg, uh, is science compatible with Christian theism? Okay, well, people who are familiar with Stand to Reason know that my first impulse is to be is to ask a question and a question to clarify the challenge. And this is almost always appropriate in these kinds of discussions. There's an advantage to it. For one, you get more information. The second advantage is it throws the ball in the other person's court 
temporarily so you can think a little bit more how you're going to respond. So if somebody says to me that science is not compatible with uh, Christianity, I'm not going to try to make a defense against that point. I am going to ask them why they would think, what do they mean, first of all, that it's not compatible? Now, I'm not entirely sure how they're going to answer, okay? I, I know that there is no there is no difficulty between uh, Christianity as a worldview, theism, and science as a method of gathering information about the physical world that God has made. There is absolutely no conflict between, I'm being careful how I choose my words here, the methods of science as opposed to a, a philosophy that kind of guides the process, governs is a better word, governs the process. We'll talk about that later. But the, the methodology and Christianity, the Christian worldview, there's no conflict at all. Now, I know this to be the case. But I could just say that, and then I'd be in kind of a bang, bang, bang with the other person. And uh, yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. But if I ask a question, which is the tactical approach, then it changes the demeanor of the conversation entirely. So when they make this statement that Christianity is inconsistent with science, I mean, say, really, what do, you, what do you mean? And I want them to explain the specific ways that it is inconsistent. Now, what's going to happen when a person asks that question? is they're going to get a very muddled response in almost every single case, if any response at all. And partly because people are saying things that they've heard others say that they think are sound. Science is at, 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 uh, at odds with Christianity or with faith, but they've never really thought it through themselves as to in what way it's at odds. And that's the question we're asking. And since they haven't thought it through, there's going to be probably a, 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 what I call the Simon and Garfunkel effect, you know, the sounds of silence coming from the other side because they've never thought about it. So I'm, I'm just, we're all, we all got something to add here. So I'm just going to uh, just put my little piece of the puzzle in answering this question. And that is the first impulse should be when someone confronts that issue to ask for clarification. In what way do you think that science is incompatible with Christian theism. And by the way, we're not just saying with faith or with religion, because those are different issues and different religions have different problems. We're talking about the compatibility of science as a methodology with Christian theism as a worldview. That's what we want to know the specifics of the conflict. Amen to that. Well, let me uh, ask the same question of, uh, of Richard, Richard Howe. Is science compatible with Christian theism? Well, I actually lost everybody for a little bit. So okay. I apologize if my thoughts here are just redundant from what Greg just got through saying, because I barely caught the very tail end uh, there. I lost internet for some reason, which is rare, but it happens every other third Haley's Comet. <laughs> so we missed the last Haley's Comet. So now I think it happened finally. <laughs> so yeah, uh, you know, I don't want to contribute to the already bad reputation that philosophers might have with some of the viewers, but I would want to understand what someone would think and mean by the terms like science, for example, because given what I know, a lot of people like, say, uh, Stephen Hawking, who's already been mentioned, Richard Dawkins, for example, we could add to the mix, given what some of them think science is, then they are most certainly not compatible because their science has been sculpted in a way that preempts any kind of truth in their mind about non-physical reality. And maybe we can get into this as we go along, but I think that point of view is self-refuting because they will always have to traffic in concepts that are, if you will, abstract. Things like what is truth are universals when you talk about humans or you talk about red or other kinds of concepts that are universals. Scientists have to traffic in these things, laws of logic and such, none of which are strictly speaking physical. Although we learn about them through the physical, they are not in and of themselves strictly physical. So if that's what people are thinking of when they think of science, then most certainly they're not compatible. But of course, what we're here today to try to put forth is science correctly understood is not only compatible with Christian theism, it will in effect entail Christian theism when done uh, well and correctly. So hopefully we'll get into some of those specifics there 
to, to, to show. And uh, I concur with Greg that it, it's, it's more than just some kind of, or, or here's another problem I have, besides what may be some poor concepts of what science is out there in the marketplace, there are also these really juvenile concepts of what theism or God is. So you'll often hear the conversation collapse into a discussion about whether God does or does not exist on par with the conversation about whether Thor does or does not exist. And the fact that somebody would think that what we mean as Christians when we talk about God is somehow in a genus that's similar to Thor or Loki or you know Isis or any number of countless gods in the world's pantheon, when they think that that's what we mean, they're already, I think, in, off on the wrong foot, not unlike the way they're off on the wrong foot when they've got this uh, sort of truncated concept of what science is. So again, maybe we'll get into the specifics about what we mean by God, but we're talking about a uh, an infinite being who has transcended to the physical world and sustains it by his power, which is not at all what any of these other, quote, gods are even, even intended to be like. So it's this really Abrahamic Christian notion of God is what we mean by theism. Yeah, when I discuss these issues with uh, unbelievers, which I do all the time, I always tell them I'm defending the Christian Trinitarian concept of God and nothing else. I will join them in their attacks on other theological systems. It's only the Christian theistic perspective that makes sense of anything. And uh, it, we always have to assume that in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 3, 15. All right. Fuzz. I love calling you Fuzz because my last name is Slick. I get teased about that. So when I get the rare opportunity to make fun of somebody <laughs> else's name, it just it's vicariously satisfying. So uh, <clears throat> is science compatible with Christian theism? And we might want to define what science is also. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I really much appreciated uh, Greg and, and Richard's thoughts on this. And and again, you know, strong in, in strong agreement. You know, uh, but I don't think we can underestimate the prevalence of this objection, actually. Uh, our, our organization has been around over 35 years, and we are, exist to proclaim the harmony between science and faith. And yet, you know, when you're out in the, in, the, in the public purview, it's amazing how prevalent this idea of conflict actually is. In fact, uh, the, the Pew Research Foundation did a, a, a published the results of a survey in the summer of 2015, where it was like 75% of people that never attend church saw conflict between science and, and religion. And in the church itself, 50% of the people that regularly attend church on a weekly basis saw conflict. And so to those uh, of uh, the viewers who are watching who are Christians, I would say that as a Christian, we should expect harmony between science and, and uh, our faith as Christians, because Scripture teaches us that God has made himself known to us in part through the record of nature. And because of that, because science is the study of nature, we would expect science to uncover evidence for God's fingerprints for, for a creator's signature in the features of the world that we live in. And in fact, we do. But to, to those people who are skeptics, uh, I would actually point out, and, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit already, is that in order to do science, and I'm here, I'm not ta I'm talking simply about the methodology of science, where it's a disciplined approach to studying nature. Um, you know, for the, with respect to the methodology of science, there are certain presuppositions you're bringing to the table in order to even do science. You're assuming, for example, that there are patterns and regularities in the world around us, and you're assuming that there's constancy in the world around us, that the world that we live in tomorrow will be the same as the world is today. And if these two things are not true, there's no way that you can actually do science. But even more importantly, uh, we also are assuming that the world that we live in is intelligible and that as human beings, we have the, the sensory and the cognitive apparatus to actually understand and make sense of the world. And it's only uh, uniquely the Christian worldview that actually lays out or, or that actually produces those set of assumptions, those set of presuppositions. Materialism or atheism doesn't do it. And in fact, even Islam doesn't do that because in Islam, the concept of God is that Allah is capricious. And because of that, you would not expect the world that we live in to, to have regularities, to have predictable patterns, to be the same 
uh, tomorrow as it is today necessarily. So, you know, if it wasn't for Christianity, the, the scientific enterprise simply would not even exist. And it's no accident that modern day science was birthed and flourished in, uh, 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 in, um, in Western Europe that was so strongly influenced by, um, by the Christian worldview. Mm. You know, I think it's important for the viewers to understand uh, some aspects about science because basically, now there's different definitions of it involving the method. So basically what it is for the viewers is seeing something, observing something, theorizing about the why of that something, and then developing ways to test your hypothesis, your idea about it, and then modifying your theory and until it becomes acceptable and you obtain what's called predictability. This is a general idea of what it is. And so it has to assume the uniformity of nature. It has to assume the laws of logic, the integrity of scientists, et cetera. And um, so these things are all philosophically based. So here's one thing that a lot of people don't understand about science. It's based on looking at material things. It's not judge, able to judge spiritual things or transcendentals or universals, like uh, what redness is or what goodness is or things like that. And so this is one of the aspects about, uh, about it. And I forgot who said, uh, you know, mentioned materialism and how it's self-refuting. I love to get into that. I use it all the time. But nevertheless, let's, uh, let's do some more questions here. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> okay, Greg, Greg Kokel. Uh, by the way, I really enjoyed your stuff. You don't remember this, but I interviewed you on my radio show years ago. It was a good okay. conversation. I thought you were a rock star, a Matt Slick. You know, you sound like a rock star, you know. so <laughs> Actually, I want to be a politician and run for presidency because, hey, I'm perfect for it. That's so right. I'm slick enough. I'll tell you, I, I learned to run as a kid because of that name. My dad was in the service, moved a great deal, went to 12 different elementary schools. I, I did a lot of running. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and my wife, poor my poor wife, uh, her first name is Anique, which is French. She speaks French. And so it's Anique Slick. And a lot of people don't even believe it's her name. But at any rate. <laughs> all right. So, uh, Greg, many uh, think that science is uh, how God uh, has now made God unnecessary or even prove that there is no God. How would you respond to that? Well, I, I, they're, they're thinking, and in, in Richard used this term, I think, in very juvenile senses about how this whole project fix, fits together. And so, um, for example, uh, there was a time when people thought that Thor created lightning, all right, uh, or the thunder was the, uh, the gods bowling or something like that. So there was a physical phenomena that people had ignorance about, and therefore they, they uh, appealed to some supernatural event. Well, it turns out when we start looking more closely and in a more sophisticated way at the phenomena, um, then we realize there is a naturalistic explanation. There is an event causation stream that results in those phenomena. Okay, so God is now squeezed out of the picture in that area, all right? And as time goes on, the argument goes at least, God has been squeezed out of more and more areas that he used to be um, be, be used to explain. And uh, the origin of life and uh, the biological development of life evolution is a huge, huge example. And I think this sits massive on the horizon for making this kind of claim. We don't need God to explain that either now this is a wildly contentious claim in my view because they're uh this uh, the, the well i i, I want to say charitably that the jury is still out on that but i don't think it is i think that the darwinian model has demonstrated itself to be inadequate to do the job and um but that's right in people's minds okay so that's this is so what they're what the sense is is that god is getting squeezed out little by little as ex, uh, as an explanatory element in the physical world. Okay, the problem is, is they're only looking at one side of the equation. Um, actually, modern people don't really believe that uh, God's bowling caused thunder. You know, they believe that most phenomena are explained by event causation that can be described in, in naturalistic terms. But there are certain things that science has encountered that um, are completely resistant to that kind of explanation because they have the fingerprints of design all over them. 
In other words, even in principle, things like the uh, uh, the information on the DNA double helix or what's stored in in uh, the the um, the code of uh, proteins, etc., the sequencing there of proteins and fuzz is much more capable of speaking to the details of that. Mm -hmm. But just in general, there's a whole there's a whole massive library written inside of our cells, and there is no naturalistic explanation even in principle we also have the origin of the universe both of these things the origin of life and the development of life and the the uh the origin of the universe seem to be singularities unique kinds of things that that naturalistic processes even in principle cannot explain and so therefore the more we study the more we find how big these areas are and how significant they are and how a naturalistic explanation is completely inadequate to the task and so the rise of science has gotten rid of frivolous explanations that nobody believes anymore nobody takes seriously but it's also uncovered massive areas that aren't just lacking explanation and we'll get to the explanation in the future they are look at i here's some notes right here all right some notes on my own talk science and faith are they compatible uh, i i remember um stephen meyer saying once in a lecture many many years ago really had an impression on me one of the founding fathers of the design movement and he said you know you could examine this piece of paper and be able to describe everything on this paper exhaustively as to its physical content, but you will never know what it says. And what he's identifying there is there are some, there are two different realms here. Meaning is in a different realm than molecules. Science can tell you about molecules, but it can't tell you about meaning, about what the words on the paper mean. And that's exactly what we discover in the cell, in the double helix, on the, uh, the, the, the protein molecules, you know, on the sequencing, all of that we find design blueprints for things. And these, we know where these come from. They come from intelligence. So what science has actually done is it's not squeezed God out of the picture. The only place it's done that is in frivolous cases where people don't take that seriously anyway. What it's done is revealed an entire world in which um, God's intervention creatively and intelligently is not only the best explanation for the evidence, but it turns out to be the only explanation that's going to be adequate to the evidence. And, and, and this, by the way, the evidence I'm talking about is the methods of science, the observational methods. This is where the philosophy that drives science, metaphysical naturalism, mm -hmm. starts doing its work and disqualifying, not based on the methods of science, which is one definition, but based on the driving metaphysical philosophy of science that disqualifies the evidence, even when it's off, uh, obvious, right out of the gate. And that's the game that's going on. It's a shell game between a philosophical point of view that's doing most of the work here, not a methodology of science that is somehow threatened by Christian theism. Wow, I would like to take the last minute of what you said, all those big words, which I know what they mean, and just play it in a loop because I love hearing stuff like that. Uh, it's, it's just, oh, metaphysics, transcendentals. I, you know, I talk to my wife and I just talk saying words like that, hoping it'll uh, you know, yeah. impress her. But uh, I love that stuff, seriously. Okay, we're going to take a break now, at the, and uh, we will be right back with uh, <clears throat> Dr. Richard Howe. We have Fuzz, I love that, and Greg Coco. I'm your host, Matt Slick. We'll be right back after. Hi, my name is Tony Costa, and I just want to encourage you to support Trinity Channel. Uh, this is a unique uh, channel in that uh, you will not get the uh, media attention or the news that you will hear in other outlets. Uh, Tr Trinity Channel uh, provides you with up-to-date and straightforward uh, news and information, particularly about Islam and Christianity. And I would encourage you to support this ministry. It is a very necessary uh, ministry. It's one that is unlike many others. It is being broadcast in uh, eight states uh, in the United States, in parts of Canada, and also uh, overseas. And so we would uh, encourage you uh, to consider uh, donating 
uh, your uh, funds towards this ministry to help us get the gospel of Jesus Christ out, uh, particularly to those in the Muslim world. And uh, we pray that uh, you would uh, consider uh, the Trinity Channel as one of your uh, ministries that you will support and help us expand this ministry so that we will be able to reach out to uh, as many people as we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your time, and may God richly bless you. Bye for now. Thank you for watching and supporting ABN channels. If God places it on your heart, please call now to donate at 248-416-1300 or visit us at www.trinitychannel.com or send checks to our P.O. Box 724 Wald Lake, Michigan 48390. Welcome back. We are on the air here with Dr. Fazel Rana and uh, Dr. Richard Howe, Greg Kokel, and myself. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to continue this discussion on is science compatible with Christian theism. Now, let's make a slight note. Notice the title is not is Christian theism compatible with science. Christian theism is true. It's a revelation of God. And we have to find out whether science agrees with Christianity. That's the real issue. Now let's get to, uh, is, is Dr. Howe with us still? Yeah, yeah there he is. Okay. Uh, every, every other five minutes, I'm not with you, apparently. <laughs> well, you know, I'm an ex-computer tech, so I might be able to help you during a break if you want. Uh, All but, right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I think time. the gerbil in my uh, generator is probably getting a little tired or something, so we can hook up a couple of tin cans and a string if we if we need to. So, yeah. So, at any rate. That works. Right. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> All right. Well, I got a question for this. While you're on, let's okay. see. Uh, what would you say to people? I love this question. It's a very good question. What would you say to people who claim that science is all we need to understand truth about reality? Yeah, I think we've hinted at some aspects of the answer to that. You know, this kind of idea that science is the end all and do all and be all of human knowledge found its most recent impetus, I think, in the early part of the 20th century around the 1930s with uh, A.J. Ayer's seminal work, Language, Truth, and Logic, where he tried to advance this idea that everything in the human theater can ultimately be subsumed under the discipline of the sciences. And he was attempting very deliberately to dismiss questions of ethics and questions of religion and questions of philosophical metaphysics and things like that, just dismiss them all in toto as being really me cognitively meaningless. And I think it was relatively short-lived in the philosophical community because it became sort of self-refuting because his own system of how we know what meaning is was itself not susceptible to his own standards. So it's sort of this lurking self-refuting. But then that kind of sentiment then was, you know, experienced a renaissance with the uh, completely bereft of philosophy and philosophical skills, theater, of the new atheism, people like Richard Dawkins, for example, uh, who really then began to make this popular. And I think with the internet and other kinds of uh, broad access to just about any idea anybody has, it's gained a lot of purchase and doesn't really see itself as self-refuting. It just really appeals, I think, to a lot of people in the marketplace that science is all we need to, to know what we need to know about uh, anything, really. And I think that self-refuting dimension is still there. I mean, it's very interesting that Richard Dawkins would, in effect, say every question is a scientific question. Well, the dispute about whether every question is a scientific question is itself not a scientific question. That is a philosophical question. As we sort of uh, mentioned at the top of the broadcast, these kind of things are perhaps subtle in some respects, but they're still underneath a lot of the explicit 
talk that goes on under the guise of we're having this scientific discussion to go, well, you realize you're making philosophical assumptions. I had a debate once at the university at uh, Georgia State University, and I kept, you know, as self-serving as it sounds, I kept going on about how the question of God's existence is a philosophical question. Got a question from the audience. This gentleman said, well, who are you to say that it's a philosophical question? I was sort of taken aback by that because to me, that was like asking a scientist who's talking about deciduous trees. And somebody says, well, who are you to say that a dis scientific discussion about trees is a botanical question? You go, well, it's not like we just define botany and then decide to scoop in whatever we think we want to uh, include under the category botany. It's the other way around. We have these observations about plants and we give the name botany to that. We we're already having the examination. So the philosophical questions is not like, hey, let's just define this categories and then try to see if we can absorb as much as we want of the uh, conversation to come under our purview. It's the other way around. It just happens to be that a question about questions is itself philosophical. Questions about truth are philosophical. Questions about the nature of change are philosophical. Questions about causality are philosophical. Questions about natures. Are, do humans have natures? Or are we just reducible to a sort of cumulative effect of our component parts? All of those questions, and I'm not suggesting they're exclusively philosophical, but in my experience, and I think the other two here, maybe all of you would concur that too often the elements of it that are philosophical rarely get brought up, much less examined and people do their due diligence to try to give a cogent defense of whatever philosophical assumption that they're uh, excuse me, that they're working from. Uh, so it's it's a self-refuting position for the Dawkins of the world to say every kind of question is a scientific question. Hey, Matt, can I offer a tactical sure. kind of uh, response? Uh, how you yeah. how somebody who has followed the point can maybe engage a conversation here about the self-refuting nature here. When somebody says the kind of thing that you've just raised in the question, you, you want to question them. And so I'm going to role play it back and forth real quickly. So what you're saying is that science is the only thing that can give you reliable truth about something. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Do you believe that's reliable, what you just said, and that it's true? Yeah, of course it is. I wouldn't be saying it. Okay. Tell me the scientific evidence that you have to support the statement you just made. Okay, so now just a simple set of questions to exploit this problem that uh, Richard was talking about. We call this the suicide tactic <laughs> for obvious reasons. Another way I put it is if people say, I don't believe in God, why not? There's no scientific evidence for it. Well, I said, well, then you shouldn't believe in science either. Why not? Because there's no scientific evidence for it. All the evidence for science is philosophical. Science works based on a philosophical foundation. And then once the foundation is placed, you can do science. That's the point that Richard's been making. But anyway, there's some questions that people uh, can, uh, can use and employ in a conversation that will help them make the point that Richard has made so well. Yeah, and it's true that all systems of thoughts have to presuppose certain values that they cannot justify inside your system of thought without affirming circularity and then getting into the worldview issue of what justifies circularity. Dr. F uh, Dr. Fuzz. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just like that. You know, I, I, I'm enjoying that. Dr. Fuzz. Okay. We all call him Fuzz. No worries. Fuzz. I like Dr. Fuzz. I want a doctor. So I can be called Dr. Reverend Slick. I just think it would be just great. But, uh, you know, his name Dr. Butcher, right? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think that's Dr. Butcher. and yeah. I, I had an organic yeah. chemistry professor named Dr. Butcher, and yes, he was. Really? I remember watching Johnny Carson once, and they had these phrases, a botch of surgeons, you know, a wrench of mechanics, and they reminded me of that. <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, okay, I got a question for you. Dr. Fuzz, Mr. Fuzz. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, now, I'm really interested in this question. I want to see how you answer this because I, I love this. What is the most, in your opinion, uh, some very compelling evidence, scientific evidence for the existence of God? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that, that I think is really um, uh, important to appreciate, and, and uh, Greg brought this up, I believe, and that is no matter what area of science you're looking at, you ultimately do see evidence for 
a, a creator's necessity and a creator's handiwork. So for example, in cosmology, we have this really inconvenient observation that the universe had a beginning. And once you now are in that arena, uh, you, you are really forced to posit a cause for the universe that exists outside the universe. That's a transcendent cause that would have brought the universe into existence. And uh, and so, you know, right away, that that is, you know, really um, provocative uh, and obviously is pointing to some type of, of theism, uh, you know, and, and of course it affirms the, the very first verse of, of uh, scripture, Genesis 1-1. But on top of that, we also see you know, really powerful evidence for design in the very structure and fabric of the universe itself. When it comes to the origin of life question, again, we, we run into a, uh, into a wall when we try to explain the origin of life through chemical evolution. Uh, and in fact, the, I won't get into the specifics here, there's a very powerful case you can actually make uh, starting with work in chemical evolution for the necessity of intelligent agency in bringing about the origin of life. Uh, living systems have this, you know, undeniable appearance of design, whether we're looking at biochemical systems or we are dealing with, you know, uh, biological systems at the organismal level. And of course, even when it comes to the origin of humanity, our, our very nature, our exceptional nature, again, is something that uh, defies an evolutionary explanation and really points to uh, the, the the necessity of uh, of some kind of creator bringing human beings into existence uh, that that we are exceptional in other words in in ways that align with the image of God concept. So the the point here is that there's just a, an incredible collective body of evidence that really points to the necessity of a creator. Uh, and and when we look at the, the universe, we look at living systems, the, the evidence for design just literally screams at us. And, you know, it was real, the design of biochemical systems that convinced me as a, a graduate student uh, who was an agnostic that there had to be a mind behind everything that we see. These systems are uh, highly, uh, you know, ingenious. These systems are sophisticated. They're elegant. Uh, they they just literally again scream of design, and you know to me you know Greg was mentioning earlier the idea of uh, the fact that biochemical systems are at their essence information systems, and that is extremely provocative because you know from experience that information always comes from a mind, and so the fact that we see information in the cell again and and, and that that it's essentially the essence of the cell is really really suggestive that that life must come from the work of a mind. But on top of that, that information is actually defined by something called the genetic code. Uh, and we know too that codes come from mind. So it's it's kind of like a double argument, if you will. Um, one of the things that that is interesting also is that, um, uh, you know, biochemists studying the structure of DNA have, have discovered that instantiated within the structure of DNA, uh, is essentially an even bit parity code. And anybody that knows something about computer science knows that this is a device used to detect error in data transmission. And so even in the design of the information, we now begin to see this, these features that are, that are incredibly you know, suggestive in, uh, of design and reminiscent of the types of designs that we produce. Uh, and I'll stop here. One more, one more example that I, that I think is mind boggling, and that is uh, uh, scientists have also discovered that the, the, the way in which the cell's machinery manipulates the information in DNA uh, is literally a computer operation. In fact, the similarity between what's going on in, when DNA is replicated, for example, or DNA is transcribed and how a computer system functions is so similar, is so stark in, 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 in comparison that it has actually inspired an area of nanoscience called DNA computing, where scientists are literally building today computers from DNA and the enzymes that manipulate DNA in the cell. And, and these computers are housed in these little tiny test tubes that are about this big. Uh, they're wet computer systems, and they're more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer system we've ever built. And there's a number of reasons why that's the case. But 
and so when you when you see these kind of features in uh, in living systems, it's hard to to uh, to conclude anything other than that these systems really must be the work of a mind. Hmm. Well, that sounds really interesting. You know, um, I've been doing apologetics for forty years and uh, debated a great great deal. About two weeks ago, I was talking to an atheist about the evidence for God. And out of nowhere, I said something I'd never said before. He said, well, what's the best evidence you've got for God? And I, I just said, you, you are. And Romans 1.19 says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. And I said, you are the one who understands and is aware, he's an atheist, of truth and morality and intelligence and beauty and value. I said, you cannot explain those in a physical realm. You can only know those internally, and they're universal truths that you're aware of. Where do they come from? They come from God. Because if you're going to look only at the physical realm, you're not going to find those. But yet, these are the things that guide you in your physical realm. Yeah. And so this is why inside it, you already know you're the best, at, you know, it's a way of saying it. You're the best evidence, you know, Matt, yourself. It, Matt, there's it, a great, I'm sorry to interrupt. You. No, no, go ahead. Um, there's a great movie that makes the point that Fuzz has been making. It was made oh, probably 25 years ago. It's called Contact. And it has Jodie yeah. Foster in it, and she's a, a young scientist who's got the earphones on with the big, with the big, uh, with the big uh, dishes out there in Arizona desert, and then she's part of the SETI project, the searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, and she's waiting for ET to call, as she put it, you know. And then what happens is a series of of, of, of beeps kind of come in from outer space, and they begin to anal analyze it, and they are marking all of the prime numbers. Okay. It's not just random. It's marking the prime numbers. Now, what's really interesting about the movie, and it was actually meant to be a discussion about faith and science, and it turned out to be very stupid in that way because it didn't follow the obvious storyline that was really uh, important. And that was the storyline that it started with, that you have these beeps coming in that are not random, which is evidence of intelligence. That's their point. And here we're just simply talking about prime numbers, right? Okay. And um, yet when it comes to the, the, the kinds of things Fuzz was just talking about, we have massive and incredible complexity. Why is it that people aren't willing to draw the same simple, straightforward, common sense conclusion okay. from that, that Jodie Foster uh, playing Ellie Arroway in Contact did from a series of beats from the outer space, which is what scientists are looking for in this SETI project to evidence intelligence out there. Well, well you know, Greg, to build off of that point, you know, so often you, you hear people just say, look, design or intelligent design cannot be part of the, the construct of science. But as you're pointing out, there are scientific disciplines that are predicated on design detection. Right. You know, SETI is one of them. Archaeology is another one. And, mm -hmm. and, and I've got a lot of interest in archaeology for a number of reasons. And, and, and I've been looking very carefully at how is it that an archaeologist can pick up a rock and say this rock was shaped through natural processes versus this rock was shaped through the work of some kind of agent, a, a hominin of some sort, let's say. And, and there's actually a, a, a set of criteria that they use that they step through that SETI uses, that, that crime scene investigators use. In fact, this is the same set of criteria, interestingly enough, that people were using when they were debating whether the SARS-2 coronavirus was man-made or whether it was mm. you know, a zoonotic transfer. And it's essentially, does that system display artificiality, right? Does it appear to be designed? And can you explain that design through natural process mechanisms and then what does it take to actually try to fabricate that system or to replicate that kind of design? And when you go through that criteria, you, you, uh, you, can, you, very, you, you can rigorously determine if something is designed or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in fact, when you apply that criteria to biochemical systems, they, they surely look designed. Nobody disputes that. You know, we, we, the, the, the origin of biochemical systems is the origin of life problem. There's no explanation for that. And, and now we've got the, the benefit of a, of a new area of biology called synthetic biology, where people are literally trying to create artificial cells in the lab. 
And what we've learned through that experience is that that, that effort is only possible because of the, the ingenuity uh, of the researchers that are involved. That, that in, in other words, there's this empirical demonstration time and time again that intelligent agency is critical to get molecules to, to form super systems that begin to assume the properties of life. So the question of design is, is a rigorous scientific question, though the implications are philosophical and theological once you, you reach that conclusion. I mean, this might be a good time to make this distinction that we've been bumping around the sides of for a while. And I, I got this from, the, who was the author of Darwin on Trial? One of the founding father, grandfather. Oh, Philip Johnson. Yeah, Phil Johnson. Well, I was listening to the radio when he made this distinction driving down the 101 freeway. And man, it stuck like glue because it was so good. He says there are two distinct definitions of science. And one is the one we've been talking about a lot here. And that is a certain kind of methodology to examine the physical environment and to manipulate it and gain knowledge about it. Okay. And you've even pointed out, Fuzz, just now that even in that realm, we still have room for design archaeology, et cetera. So, um, but there's another definition that is in competition. And that is the, and here we get into the philosophy. This is the philosophical point of view that drives it. Now we've used these fancy terms before, but let me just make it simple. Philosophical materialism or metaphysical materialism simply means that the only thing that exists in the universe is stuff. Okay. Pushed around by natural law you know, matter in motion. I mean, that's it. It's meat all the way down, so to speak. And there's nothing that's non-physical that exists. Okay. That's a philosophical point of view. All right. It's a metaphysical view of what is real. All right. What happens though, is that sometimes when people are saying something is not scientific, they're saying, well, it doesn't follow the methodology properly. And that, for example, if uh, what uh, um, uh, astro astrology, for example, well, that's not scientific. Why? Because it doesn't follow the methodology properly. Okay. But what about creation? Oh, that's not scientific either. Why not? Well, people are thinking it's violating the first definition of methodology, but that's not the reason. That's why we got a guy like Fuzz and a whole bunch of others like they're doing the research they're doing. They are imposing a second definition. You're bringing God into the picture, and that disqualifies your view, even if it's supported by the first definition of science, the methodology. And so this is the shell game that's going on. And many have admitted this. Many, many, many in the field have just been upright and admitted this. If the philosophy or the conclusions you draw based on the methodology are not consistent with the philosophy, then the philosophy trumps the method every single time. Well, you know, Greg, just to build off of that point, I can't tell you how many uh, origin of life researchers I could quote who have said statements to the effect that the origin of life appears to be a miracle. And yet immediately afterwards, they will backtrack and they'll say, but we know that when we engage in a scientific investigation, we must pursue mechanistic explanations. And this is exactly the point you're making, right? Is that it appears to be a miracle, but yet we can't go down that path. Uh, and so therefore we're limiting uh, our explanation to a failed approach, but that's preferred because of the, the philosophy of science is trumping now the, the, the investigative uh, conclusions of science, which to me as a scientist is very sad because now science is not about the pursuit of truth, but it's about a pursuit of certain types of explanations. Right. And we're, we're rendering science impot impotent when in fact it has, the, I think, the power to really uh, take us beyond, you know, what uh, the constraints of methodological naturalism, you know. Yeah. I'd like to ask, do you want the right answer or do you want the right kind of answer? And of course, you and I know that it's the second, not the first. They want the right kind of answer. You know, one of the things I, I enjoy doing uh, when I'm having these impromptu debates, which happens a lot with um, with atheists, is they will, when we're talking about this kind of a topic, and they'll adopt methodological naturalism, materialism, naturalism of different forms. And I always say it's all self-refuting. Because if the physical universe is all there is, then that means everything in the universe has to operate under the laws of physics, which means our physical brain must operate under the laws of physics. But if that's the case, then how do we know that our brain is producing proper logical inference? In other words, if it's just chemical reactions in the brain that are operating and restricted to the laws of physics, 
then how do you know it's thinking correctly? Because it's just reacting chemically. And this means that you can't trust the whole philosophical basis of materialism or naturalism, and it should be rejected because that which refutes itself cannot be trusted. This is a real simple approach I've used many, many times with atheists, and there is no competent response that they've given. Uh, I've been able to answer them very, very easily, and I found it to be very, very effective. And it's something that the listeners might want to consider, that materialism is self-refuting. The idea that the material world is all there is cannot account for our thinking and rationality because one chemical state in the brain that produces another chemical state in the brain just produces chemical states. It doesn't necessitate proper logical inference. Now, I know that you guys want to jump in, maybe probably on this, but I think we're about due for a break. So if one of you wants to jump in for, say, two minutes on that, and then we'll take well, a that break. Well, out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's either fuzz or how. Which one do you want to jump in? Make, make, make a small comment on that. What do you think? Well, well uh, Go ahead, Richard. No, no, please. Well, I was ahead. just going to say, I think the the uh, argument we've got them on the hook <laughs> in two different ways. One, if we concede to them the false philosophical assumption that of this reductionism that everything can be reduced down to the the function of the parts out of which a thing is made. Let's say laws of physics. Then, then the argument from design and these kind of things are, I think, are 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 definitive because they're not going to be able to be explained according to these mechanistics. But if we then lobby for a better philosophical assumption, like, for example, there are such things as metaphysical truths, things like natures, things like uh, change, things like cause. Then from there, we can build our argument philosophically for the existence of God, irrespective of whatever else the scientists might want to think about uh, about some of these issues. So we got them kind of coming from two different directions. I think. Amen. 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 You want to add a little bit that uh, to that fuzz? I was just simply going to say that I was uh, just wanted to build off of your point uh, because when I mentioned earlier that one of the assumptions that goes into uh, the, the scientific enterprise, it's the intelligibility of the universe and our ability to understand the universe, which is predicated on our capacity to, to be able to think in, in, in reliable cognitive ways and in the reliability of our sensory input. And there's nothing in, a, in an evolutionary framework that would demand that our minds, which are the product of evolution, would would be produced in such a way to ensure those two things are true. In other words, if you view human beings as the product of, of a materialistic process, then there's no reason to think that our, our minds are trustworthy. Uh, and, and in fact, this uh, Darwin wrote himself wrote a, a letter where he was essentially expressing this very doubt uh, mm. about the implications of, of his ideas with respect to human origins. I agree. All you got to do to verify that is just look at uh, Washington, D.C. A, a lot of problems there that aren't working. It's, the philosophy isn't going there. All right, <laughs> folks, we're going to take a break now, and we'll be right back after, oh, I don't know, a few minutes. So please stay tuned. We'll be back with these great guests. Be right back. Hi, I'm Don Deal. I'm the Director of Research and Development for Norm Geisler International Ministries. And Norm Geisler Ministries is so pleased to be part of the International Apologetics Marathon here at the Trinity Channel. 
and so pleased to be supportive of what they do here at the channel. Trinity Channel is the English language channel of ABNSAT, and one thing that they do which is unique in the Christian broadcasting world is have extended period of time devoted simply to apologetics, to reaching out. Apologetics, if you don't know, comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to give an answer or defense. So what are they doing? They're responding to the message of 1 Peter 3.15 where it says, always be ready to give an answer, that is an apologia, for the hope that's within you with gentleness and respect. There's one thing that should always determine how we do our apologetics. It is to remember always we're representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And the people here at Trinity Channel are so pleased to be a part of that. Well, there's more to being a Christian than simply giving answers or simply memorizing Bible verses. There's a, there's a Christian's most powerful weapon we have when we're dealing with the powers and principalities that come against the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. That most powerful, I give it to you in three steps. Prayer, prayer, prayer. That simple. Pray. Pray for this network. Pray for the mission. Pray for the millions of people that can be reached through this network. There's over 6 billion people on earth and just about a little over 2 billion Christians. Think about what that means as far as the opportunities to be reached. Trinity Channel is available on IPTV. It's available on uh, through the internet, satellite channels. But all of this costs money. So there's a second aspect that we need to be worried about here. We need to be concerned about supporting them. So what I'm here to do today is to ask you to pray, or pray for this network, pray for this ministry, because this is a ministry. Pray for them with your heart. Pray for them. Bring their name before the Lord God Almighty. But also remember, if you can, to consider supporting financially this very important ministry. There's studios, there's guests, there's the internet, there's the expenses of broadcast. There, there's so many expenses, it gets, it, it's really, really overwhelming at times. Through the, through the efforts of man, through his own flesh and bones, through his own efforts, could never achieve this. It has to be through the power of God. We're asking you to use prayer to reach out to God, to ask for our blessings, the blessings on this network. And we're also prayerfully asking you to consider coming alongside, partnering with, be it a one-time gift, be it a recurring gift, but please consider supporting this important and powerful ministry. Norm Geisler International Ministry supports this network, and we hope you will too. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Now, uh, we got a little bit of a question to answer here, real simple one for the new viewers. What does ABN stand for? It stands for Aramaic Broadcasting Network. And there's a website, ABNSAT, satellite TV, ABNSAT.com. We are on the Trinity Channel, and we are here with uh, three great guys, uh, Dr. Fazel. I feel bad saying his name, name each time because I think I messed it up. We call him Fuzz. Not easy like my name, Slick. We also have Dr. Richard Howe and, of course, Greg Kokel. And uh, welcome back, you guys. Really appreciate you being here. I am truly enjoying this topic. Now, uh, I do have a question, Dr. Dr. Fuzz. Um, I think it's a great question to, ans to ask and, and to discuss. Uh, why are so many scientists resistant to the idea of intelligent design? What's the reason? Yeah, well, you know, I want to, first of all, just simply point out that nobody uh, – uh, disputes the idea that the universe appears to be designed and nobody disputes the idea that design is evident and apparent in biochemical and biological systems. 
In fact, it's interesting to me that that uh, biologists simply can't get away from uh, using design language when they describe biological and biochemical systems. Uh, they can't get away from teleological language attributing uh, intent and purpose uh, to, the, to the, the, the structure and the function of, of biological systems. So nobody really disputes the appearance of design. Uh, the, the real dispute is the source of that design. And as we've been talking about already, uh, within uh, science today, the, the, this idea of methodological naturalism essentially constrains explanations uh, that scientists can pursue. Uh, and, and methodological naturalism, again, just to review, is this idea that when you engage in scientific work, that you can only pursue natural process mechanistic explanations. Uh, you cannot uh, pursue explanations that in, in some way, shape, or form involve the supernatural. And, and so because of that, uh, when you see evidence for design, instead of drawing the, the logical conclusion that there is a mind behind that design, you're forced to try to come up with some type of way to explain that design through mechanism. And this is where I think uh, uh, work in the life sciences has, has really uh, failed, it, it, if I may say so, miserably, and that is to try to account for that design through mechanism alone. This is, there are significant problems, uh, you know, with, with evolutionary explanations for uh, the origin of life and the origin of design in, in living systems. But again, because of the influence of methodological naturalism, as scientists, then you have no place to go but to failed explanations. Uh, so the, the resistance is really philosophical. It's not that the evidence is somehow uh, taking us in a different direction. You know, years ago, I went to an atheist convention. I've flown out and, and just kind of uh, tried to lay under the radar, but they, they recognized me. And so I got to be careful. But so I was at this atheist convention and they had some big uh, lecture. And I'll never forget it. I was sitting there and just, I could still, I was still here. It, it, I could see the screen. I could see the speaker and the whole bit because it stunned me. And they said, uh, well, the universe certainly appears to be designed because of this and this and this and this is designed that, this and that. But we know it's not. And I'm like, what? And, you know, what? why? Well, because there is no God. It was just begging the question ad nauseum. And uh, I never forgot that. It just, but it's just not. Anyway, uh, so Dr. Howe, uh, uh, what do you think about this issue? Why is it the scientists don't want to admit design? Yeah, I think, too, besides what may be uh, said about this in terms of their philosophical, I'm sorry, their sort of scientific machinations going on in their mind. That as Christians, we know that really the problem is a spiritual problem. Uh, I think they see where some of the argument is aiming and uh, don't like what they see, as none of us liked what we might have thought about the world before we came to faith in Christ. Now, I realize that's not very compelling explanation to the non-believer. But, you know, the thing is, uh, I think Christianity has a better explanation of why there are atheists than atheism has as to why there are Christians. You know, Feuerbach tried to explain why people are religious. Freud tried to explain why people are religious. Jung tried to explain. You have a, a, a litany of people who are unbelievers who tried to explain religion, but there's nothing really uh, of, the, of these various views, uh, some of which are incompatible with each other, but none of them really arise out of their unbelief or out of their atheism as such. But Christianity actually predicts that there would be unbelievers. It's part of the Christian view of reality that there are people who are going to rebel against that. So at least when we say that as part of our explanation, we are consistent with our own view of the nature of reality and are not throwing that in ad hoc as if somehow we've got to muster some kind of uh, explanation on the fly. And they'll say, how about this? No, it's actually part of our view of the nature of reality that there's more to these equations than just merely the intellectual. But there's a moral issue in terms of our accountability before our maker. 
Mm -hmm. Amen. That's uh, Romans 1, 18. They suppress the truth of God in their unrighteousness. So this is ultimately a moral issue because they're seeking to behave in a manner that's autonomous from God. We Christians have to be careful. We do not want to simply go to their level and say, here's the perfect way of proving God exists. It can only and should only be done inside of the Christian worldview. Reason, evidence, and all the necessary preconditions for intelligibility have to presuppose the Trinitarian nature of God. You, you know, and, and, and Matt, also, it's interesting, Paul's argument through Romans 1, because uh, most of us really point out, understandably, the significance of verses 18 through 21. Yeah. But if you follow, if one follows the argument of Paul, by the time you get to verse 28, the people who suppress that truth and unrighteousness have, in effect, eradicated that knowledge of God by the time you get to verse 28, which explains why we find people around us who claim to be atheists. They, they, they're worse than just suppressing a truth. They've actually considered that truth and didn't, con didn't regard it as something they even wanted to keep in their knowledge. Well, it's a truth vacuum. <clears throat> it was Satan who first doubted the true nature of truth. God, who knows all things, mm -hmm. reveals what is true. And that's the only way we can have absolute knowledge if the infinite being reveals truth to us. And Satan, the first thing he did, he said was, did God really say? In other words, God's not the necessary precondition for truth. And we can doubt what he says, and then we can make up our own truth. It's the issue of autonomy. So, uh, Greg, now I know that you may have to leave uh, early. And if you yeah, do that. Yeah, about 10 okay. minutes early, sorry. Yeah, you can just do this on your way out. That'll be fine. We won't, <laughs> won't be better. But, uh, <clears throat> do you want to add anything about the intelligent design uh, issue or why scientists, why people are rejecting? We've kind of covered it. Well, I think the, uh, the other fellows got to the heart of the matter and simply put, people don't want to bend the knee. Yeah, um, that's, that's just it. the long and short of it. And what's <laughs> interesting about this particular point is many of them are quite candid about this. Uh, mm -hmm. They simply do not want God in their life. They will say this, uh, and I'm I'm thinking of uh, you know some of the some of the people who've been strong, uh, even some lately. Um, who's the um, you know, um, the name escapes me right now. He he wrote a, a book of uh, mm -hmm. Mind and Cosmos. You know, philosopher of New York University, uh, Thomas, Thomas Nagel. Nagel. Thomas Nagel, yeah. right? And so he basically says, as an atheistic philosopher, he's looking at the uh, the materialistic neo Darwinian worldview, and he says it's almost certainly false. That's part of the title of his book. It's almost certainly false. And, and the reason is, is because it doesn't account for all the details of reality and a worldview ought to do that instead of just deny obvious details of reality. He said, but then he goes on in his book and, and he, he also says Christians have kind of gotten a bad rap and especially intelligent design cr crowd, you know, for their own view and a lot of hostility. But but then he says, I, I, I don't want to go to God. I want to try to find a way to rework my own system to make room for things like consciousness, which is his special. Notice how he's looking at the real problems of the reigning paradigm, but he is not willing to adjust his philosophy to fit the facts. He wants to find another explanation that will allow him to keep God out of the picture. Now, he's just one notable example. And by the way, he took a lot of heat for his book from the secular side. But uh, even so, he still wants to be a card-carrying atheist, just not a Darwinist in the, in the standard sense of the word, uh, because he doesn't think it explains enough. But uh, there are many, many others who have made the same statement, some in more elaborate terms. I do not want God telling me what to do, how to live, who to sleep with, what to, how to carry on my life. They are quite candid about this. They are right up front about it. It's almost as if the facts don't matter. Um, Frank Turek has a famous question that he asks in his uh, university engagements when somebody proposes him. And he says, look, if I could give you solid evidence to demonstrate that Jesus was the Messiah, that he rose from the dead, that, that the Christian worldview is actually true, would you commit yourself to Christ? That's a standard question. And they say no. So, he, you know, he said, well, why am I wasting my time here? The problem is not with your mind. It's with your heart. You know, the rest of Romans 1, I, I'll, I quote scripture a great deal to unbelievers, mm -hmm. even though they don't accept it. I quote it because it's the power of God. 
but I'll say, look, in Romans 1, because you are denying the truth, then God gives you over to judgment. And I say you're behaving exactly in a manner consistent with what the scripture says. And I really believe in the power of, of God's word, Isaiah 55, 11. We could talk about that. Greg, I know you got to go a little bit quicker, but I, I want to talk about this. You, this idea of Christianity is a science stopper. Yeah. It's so ironic when people say this. I think Michael Shermer said this. I did a three-hour national radio debate with Michael Shermer, the American atheist from Skeptic Magazine. And by the way, I have uh, more than a half hour here, so I don't have to wind it out real quickly. But um, uh, the irony to that charge that Christianity is the science stopper is that Christianity actually was the science starter. And I'm not sure if it was Richard or, or Fuzz who made this comment earlier on, but when you look at the history of the growth of, of, Christ, of, of science, it happened in Western Europe where there were very solid Christian convictions about the way the world was, that there was an intelligent creator who made a world that we could discover the truth of and then use for our benefit. And when you've, I've got my little cheat sheet here, you look at all of the founders of major disciplines of science, George Cuvier, Blaise Pascal, Michael Faraday, George, Gregor Mendel was a monk, by the way. He's the one who started the whole genetics thing going, you know, Copernicus, Linnaeus, Galileo, Newton, Louis Pasteur, Lord Kelvin. These guys all were massive foundational players in the development of the scientific enterprise. And these were all biblical theists. Okay. I don't know that maybe, maybe Newton wasn't a Trinitarian, but he was a biblical theist. In fact, in his Precipia, he even talks about God as a necessary foundation for uh, the, the, the physical realm and the laws of physics that he, he was, uh, was his specialty. So um, no, <laughs> Christianity hasn't been a science stopper. It's been a science starter historically. What's been a science stopper is a different religion. And that religion is metaphysical materialism. That is the religion, religious view, if you will, that steps in as a referee and says, no, we disqualify that because we don't like the conclusions that your scientific method has produced. And not only do they disqualify the, uh, the ideas, they cancel the people out. And so they've been canceling, even before the cancel culture started, this crowd has been canceling out scientists for 20 or 30 years who come to the wrong kinds of conclusions based on the philosophy. They're the science stoppers, not the religious folk. Amen. Amen. You could preach a sermon on that. What Greg uh, said, if, if, Matt, if I could build off of what ahead. Greg said, you know, just th this idea that again, Christianity is a, a, a science show stopper is, is really misapplied as Greg was alluding to, because in my experience, it's actually the, the I would even go one step further, not only a materialistic naturalism is a shot the science show stopper i would actually argue the evolutionary paradigm is as well and and the reason why i say this is because so often when we look at biological systems we're dealing with very complex systems that many times we've only begun to study and sometimes there are features of those systems that don't make sense and i see time and time again where evolutionary biologists will say well that's just simply the product of an unguided evolutionary process that just has cobbled something together. There's no rhyme or reason that it's that way. It's just the outworking of historical contingency. And, and they stop the investigation at that point, because who's going to want to invest effort into working on something that is actually uh, non-functional or doesn't have a rationale for it? And, and yet what happens is over time, people will stumble onto explanations for why things are that way and have actually delayed scientific progress in some instances by decades because of this mindset that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, if it's a product of evolution and it doesn't display obvious function, then it must be a functionless feature that is vestigial or was just again cobbled together by evolution. And the quintessential example of this would be so-called junk DNA. Uh, at, at one point, people thought that the vast proportion of, of most organisms' genomes w was non-functional junk DNA. In fact, when the human genome was sequenced, the first assessment was 
somewhere around 95% of the human genome consisted of non-functional DNA. And we're now at the point where they, arguably you could say, uh, thanks to the work of what's known as the ENCODE project, that at minimum 80% of the human genome is functional and that number is probably much closer to in the high 90% uh, that's functional. And, uh, and, and, the, and, and we went literally decades, I, the idea of junk DNA emerged probably in the 1970s. We literally were almost 40 or 50 years into work on genomic science before the, the, the evidence forced scientists to say what we thought was junk was functional. And if you were approaching this question from a design perspective or a creation model perspective, you would say, even though we don't know what the function is, we're going to assume there is some kind of function and we would have probably discovered that function sooner. And where the tragedy is, in my view, is that much of this non-functional DNA that now turns out to have function actually, uh, in many instances, contributes to the ideology of genetic disorders. And so if we would have realized the functionality sooner, we would probably for, be further along in understanding and developing treatments for a number of diseases. You know, in fact, I was uh, doing a debate a number of years ago with P.Z. Myers, who's a fairly well-known um, atheist, outspoken atheist, uh, um, and a, an evolutionary biologist. And the issue of the ENCODE project came up. And P.Z. Myers said to me, and, and I, my jaw dropped when he said this, he said, we know that the results of the ENCODE project must be wrong, because if they are, if they are correct, it means the evolutionary paradigm is wrong. And, and, be, and, and because we know that the evolutionary paradigm can't be wrong, the results of the ENCODE project cannot be correct because if that degree of functionality exists in the human genome, it just undermines key concepts in molecular evolution. And this to me was astounding because I realized that we were now in a bizarro world of science where it wasn't the data you being used to evaluate the theory, but the theory being used to evaluate the data. And to me, that's a science show stopper if, if I've ever saw one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's religion. I think it'd be great to do a show sometime on evolution, a biogenesis, information theory, and epigenetics. That would be a That'd be good. I think only three of us would enjoy it, but I, I would definitely enjoy it. Well, we only have uh, roughly six, seven minutes left in the show. I'd like to uh, ask one final question. We can go through it quickly. Um, has science ruled out the possibility of miracles such as the resurrection of Jesus? Um, Greg, you want to start? Yeah, uh, this point was made earlier, and that is that science cannot invade directly against anything in the immaterial world. It is not capable of doing that. It is a very fine methodology for measuring things about the material world, and uh, it does that job really well. No complaints there, okay? Uh, sometimes, and this is a point that Fuzz made earlier, that you can use scientific data in in conjunction with philosophical arguments in order to make a case for God from the data. That's not science arguing for God. It's the scientific data combined with a causal argument, for example, the origin of the universe that uh, from which we can infer a beginner to everything that took place. But that's a, that's a combination of science and philosophy that's entirely legitimate. We do this kind of thing all the time. But what you cannot do is you cannot say science has somehow invade or against or proven that God doesn't exist or that souls don't exist or that miracles can't happen. They say it's unscientific. There is nothing about science that invades against those kinds of things. Nothing, now the distinction again between these two definitions, really important, nothing in the methodology of science, which is what gives science its nobility, by the way. But when it comes to the philosophy, the religious philosophy that has currently governed science, well, that's the thing that's going to step in and say science that is materialistic philosophy is saying there can be no miracles. And that's the shell game that I've been talking about. When people hear science says there's no miracles, they're not talking about the kind of science that does the daily work that Fuzz and so many of others are involved with, all the scientists, to produce good things for
talking about the imposition of a religious philosophical point of view that disqualifies miracles before any evidence gets out the gate. That's what people need to understand is going on here. Well, maybe if I unmuted myself, that might help. <clears throat> I'm a tech expert, and look what I just did. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, we were all trying to look really interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, some people are glad I muted myself. <clears throat> any rate, Dr. Howe, uh, has science ruled out the possibility of miracles, especially the resurrection of Christ? Well, um, again, running the risk that I'm just going to repeat something Greg just did because my uh, dropped again. So I apologize for that inter right. intermittent dropping. Maybe a lot of people are as glad I dropped out as they did that you were muted. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I would uh, I would argue that the question of miracles collapses into a question of the existence of God, uh, period. And whatever that goes on to look like, and I have my opinions about what that argument might look like, uh, but I, I would defend that that's, that's uh, the question of miracles presupposes that. And the reason I say that is because I would define, uh, partially define miracles as an act of God. We go on to add some more to the definition. But right there, then the fact that an event could be a miracle already presupposes whether there is or isn't a God by definition. So that if a person was a consistent atheist, they would never be able to look at an, an event in the world and conclude that it's a miracle. If they were consistent, they realize, well, it couldn't be a miracle if there isn't a God. So I, I like to segment off the question of God's existence as an antecedent one. This was vividly displayed when I was a graduate student at Ole Miss many decades ago. And I had the privilege of being involved in organizing a debate between J.P. Moreland and Kai Nielsen. Kai Nielsen one of the most prolific uh, philosophical atheists of our day. And Moreland gave during his talk on uh, defending the existence of God, one of his lines of evidence was the re resurrection of Jesus. And Nielsen, when he finally got to that point in dealing with Moreland's arguments for how we knew Jesus rose from the dead, Nielsen said something to the effect, well, you know, uh, maybe he came back from the dead, you know, maybe somehow the sinews came back in and the bones got connected, whatever. He said, I'm frankly not that interested in this question. But even if that did happen, more or less, he goes, what does that have to do with whether God exists? So in other words, in his mind, he still didn't see any connection between what might be considered certainly an anomalous event uh, and the question of God's existence. But why? Because his assumptions would always lead him, if he's consistent, to just say, well, maybe there's some law of nature that every other third great conjunction of planets, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, uh, somebody rises from the dead somewhere in the world. You know, he could just say that as a as a means of just dismissing whatever people try to argue as the connection between the miraculous event and the existence of God. Amen. Okay, uh, Dr. Fuzz, I'm going to put the pressure on you. You got one minute to add something profound uh, about this issue of the miracles. Go ahead. Well, you know, just real quickly, you know, when it comes to the idea of miracles, there are those miracles that I think we're talking about here, which are, you know, where the laws of nature appear to be suspended or violated. But there's other miracles I would just simply point out, like providential miracles, that just even the, the process of conception and, and embryonic development and human birth mm -hmm. is a miracle or miracles that are the just right event happening with the just right magnitude at the just right time. And, and so I think these are two areas where science can give us some insight in, in such a way that we would actually recognize these as, as you know, miraculous events. But when it comes to violating the laws of nature, I, I don't think science can really speak about that. But it's because those events appear to be violations of the laws of nature uh, that I think you know, is reason to think that there is a, a creator, a God that is orchestrating those events in, in, a, in a way to reveal himself to us. Well, good. <clears throat> thank you very much. Now, I want to thank you, gentlemen, for uh, for being on for this hour and a half. I've really enjoyed it. I've, I've seriously, 
I've enjoyed it a great deal, and I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed it as well. Just let uh, people know I'll be hosting again in about uh, two, three and a half hours. We're going to have a discussion with some other experts on Islam discussing the issue of um, does the Bible predict the arrival of Muhammad? Yes, it does about false prophets, but that's another topic. We'll get to that. So, um, Fuzz, thank you very much. Dr. Howe, thank you very much. Greg, thank you very much. You guys are awesome. And uh, it's great to be humbled in your magnificent presence. I really enjoyed what you guys had to say. So may the Lord bless you guys. And until we meet again, thank you. Praise God. And uh, have a great, uh, great end of the year. God bless. God bless.